So starting with Acts and chapter 15. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they travelled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had been doing through them. Then some of the believers, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to discuss this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace that our Lord Jesus, of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved, just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described us to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophet of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and build, rebuild David's fallen tent. In ruins, I will rebuild. Sorry, in ruins. <laughs> its ruins, I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the remnants of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear my name says the Lord who does these things that have been known for ages. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times, and is read in the synagogues. On every Sabbath. And then turning to Ephesians and to chapter 2 and reading from verse 11. <clears throat> Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that's done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at that time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope, without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God 
through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and he preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Once I decided to build a wall. The end of the garden had no fence. It had uh, been destroyed by a storm and there were some breeze blocks. And so I got to work with the sand and cement and I made my wall. And it got so high and a friend came round to see me and made a mistake. He put his hand on the wall. And the wall collapsed completely. Let me introduce you to another wall wall that was built in 1961 and a wall that was built therefore before I was born and so all through my childhood and young adult life it had always been there. Never known a time when it hadn't been there. But then suddenly in 1989 the Berlin Wall came toppling down. Let me introduce you to a third wall. It's a wall that actually if you're in space I've been there, but I'm told you look down at the earth from space, you can see this wall, because it is the great wall of China and this particular wall has stood for generations and generations and generations, so that there's none of us here today have ever known a time when there wasn't a great wall of China, it seems has always stood. Now, last week, we were looking at particularly the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and we were seeing how they were far away. They were excluded from citizenship in Israel. They were foreigners to the covenant of the promise. They were without hope and without God. Ultimately, because right at the first at the start of that verse 12, it says that they were separate from Christ. And of course, Gentiles includes us because it is non-Jews. And verse uh, 13 tells us that they were once, or we Gentiles, were once far away. And in verse 14 of this passage, a uh, chapter in, in Ephesians, we see that there was a barrier, a barrier between Jew and Gentile called, uh, Paul calls it here, a dividing wall of hostility. This separation between Jew and Gentile. Now I'm not quite sure as to what Paul has in mind when he talks about the dividing wall of hostility, the barrier, whether that's just an illustration that stands in and of itself, the context tells you that he is primarily thinking about the barrier and the division between Jew and Gentile. But it could be that there's a reference here to Jerusalem and the temple itself, because if you ever look and you see any diagrams of the old temple, Herod's temple as it's called, you see you've got the big temple on the mount, and then you've got outside of that an area that's known as a sacred enclosure, which is surrounded by a low wall, about a metre and a half wide, uh, wide high. Um, and at various points there are gaps in this wall for the people to go through. Only it's not for all people to go through. Because to go through there, you go into this sacred enclosure. And so there would have been signs up at various places saying who was permitted and who wasn't permitted to go through there. Archaeology, or archaeologists, have discovered one of those signs. And it says this. It says, no foreigner may enter this enclosure. Anyone caught doing so will only have themselves to blame for their ensuing death. Outside of this wall was what was known as the Gentiles' court. A non-Jew could go there. They could go there and they could converse and they could do whatever in a sense, but they could not go through into the sacred enclosure. That was the forbidden zone, the exclusion zone. 
You went through there as a Gentile, and you were caught doing so. It means death. And Paul himself experienced this. Later on in his ministry, you can read about it in Acts chapter 21, he goes to Jerusalem, and what does he find? Well, he's there for some time, going in and out of the temple as he would carry on, but then, I think it's after seven days, suddenly some uh, opposition rises up and they say, Hey, there's that man Paul. He's teaching against our law. He's saying things that are bad about us. Worse, he's brought a Gentile, a non-Jew, into the temple itself through that sacred enclosure. At this, the crowd gather and they start beating Paul. And they're going to destroy him. He's going to be put to death. Except that um, a, a Roman soldier, the Romans get to hear about it. And the soldiers come down and they rescue Paul. So Paul knew from first hand experience what it was to know the wrath of the people for a Gentile to go through that sacred enclosure. As it happened, Paul had not taken any Gentiles in there. But that is another story. It ends with... Paul himself being put in prison. And indeed Ephesians is written, chapter 6 and verse 20 tells us that Paul is bound and he's in chains. And the reason he's in chains is directly because of this event in Jerusalem. And so we come this morning to consider what I would call the, the Gentile problem. Because we have, in the days of the Apostles what we might call the early church. But there was a question concerning the Gentiles, or a problem concerning the Gentiles. What to do with them? Could the Gentiles be accepted into the faith, or was something else meant to happen to them first? Before the time of Christ, if you wanted to be a Jew and you weren't born a Jew if you wanted to uh, follow the religion as it were, you had to convert to Judaism you had to be circumcised, you had to keep the law and so on what about the Gentiles now, now Christ has come the problem of the Gentiles you see for a Jew there was a natural hostility as we considered last week dogs uncircumcised dogs a natural hostility to the Gentiles. So much so that when one Cornelius, who is a Roman soldier, and therefore a Gentile, when Cornelius is desperate to seek the Lord, Peter is summoned by the Lord to go and to preach to Cornelius and his household. But if you know this story, before Peter goes... He has a vision. He goes into a trance and he has a vision. Now to Jews, there were certain foods that you weren't allowed to eat. They were unclean. God had said that they were unclean. But in his vision, the Lord speaks to Peter and shows him unclean food and says, Go kill and eat, Peter. Surely not, says Peter. I've never eaten anything unclean. It happens three times. While Peter is considering this, the servants from Cornelius' household, they come and they say, God has sent us to you. To ask you to come to our master Cornelius. To tell him about the way of the Lord. And the Holy Spirit speaks to Peter and says go with them. Peter goes with them. He goes into Gentile company. Into a Gentile house. Unclean. Uncircumcised dogs. But Peter goes because God has told him to go. And while he's proclaiming Christ to them. There is a clear evidence that these people, the scales from their eyes are taken away. And that they understand just who Christ is. And that they believe in their hearts that he is the Messiah. How does Peter and those with him know this? Because the Holy Spirit descends upon them. Just as on the day of Pentecost, they speak in tongues, they prophesy, they proclaim the majesty of God. In the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Peter knows that these have been converted. 
But it doesn't end there because when he goes back home, hey, 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 said the other disciples there, the other leaders, the other apostles, hey, what's going on with you? What happened when you went to that place, um, Caesarea? What happened when you went there? We hear that you've allowed Gentiles into the church. And so Peter has to explain his actions. And when he explains his actions, the disciples, as one, they rejoice and they say, Wow, so God has granted repentance and faith even to the Gentiles. But of course it doesn't end there. Because when something is deeply ingrained within you, it's not easy to turn the page over and just forget about it. The Jewish Christians understood that Jews themselves needed reconciling to the Lord, needed converting. But what they understood as well was that the the Jews were, were set apart anyway. From the beginning, they had their law, they had their history. They had all these things that made them a separate people. Could Gentiles, who had none of these things... Enjoy the same privilege. Enjoy the same privileges of salvation. Without something else needed. You know the power of the story of the workers in the vineyard. Some went first thing in the morning. They worked all day. Some only worked an hour. At the end, those who'd only worked an hour got a denarius. Those who worked all day assumed they would get more because they'd borne the heat of the day. And yet they were paid alike, a denarius. For the Jew, for the Jewish Christian, the difficulty here was understanding these things. Working it out, working out their faith, working out the doctrine, the teachings that Christ was giving them. Can the Gentiles be like those who come at the 11th hour and receive the same things? Or do they need to do something else as well? Is it that simple? It's great that the Gentiles are hearing the message, but is it that simple? Is it just simply repent and believe? Do they not need to do certain things in order for their exclusion to be lifted? example, be circumcised. Follow the law. If you turn to Acts chapter 15, where we read earlier. This is right in a sense at the beginning, isn't it? This is the beginning of the church. And this is a vital question that needs to be tackled by the church at that time. Some people come um, from um, Judea to Antioch. We uh, tend to call them Judaizers. Judaizers. They wanted to put Judaism, the teachings of Judaism, into the Christian faith. And they say, unless you are circumcised to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, not, you know, you'll be disobeying God, but you cannot be saved. That's a big thing, isn't it? You've got to be circumcised to be saved. Imagine that was our gospel today. Repent, believe, and be circumcised, and then we can call you Christian. That's what they're saying. Is it right? It's a vital question. It's a vital question because the whole foundation of the Christian faith rests upon it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. The gift of God. Is it by grace? Ah, it's by grace plus circumcision. Doesn't that make it works? See how vital the question is. Paul is going around preaching in the Gentile world, to Jew and Gentile alike, he's preaching free grace. Not grace plus anything. Grace unmerited. Doing nothing to deserve what you get. In fact, deserving the very opposite. Unmerited. The Gentiles are being encouraged. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. But now they're being told, 
You must be, you must do circumcision, follow the law. And so a meeting is called, you might call it the Council of Jerusalem. And there it is in uh, Acts chapter 15. Without reading it all again, because we've read it before, in verses 7 to 11, Peter stands up and he makes his own declaration. And he talks about what happened to him with Cornelius. And the vision that he had. And the clear evidence that God had come and fallen upon Cornelius and all his household. That they were converted. They didn't need to be circumcised. Why add these things to it? Says Peter. And then in verse 12... Paul and Barnabas speak about the miraculous signs that God does, the conversions, the clear evidence that God worked and is working amongst the Gentiles without them having to be or to do anything. So the question then for the early church here, this early church council at Jerusalem to consider is, why after conversion... Why, after conversion, add what God does not require? Or, or did he? Does God require this? Were circumcision and the law required by God? Or was it just a section of the church? If God doesn't require it, should the church require it? And here can you see the danger. There's a great danger. That Christians put their own authority, their own prejudice above the word of God. People do it today. I was looking on a website recently of a church and it said about the Lord's Supper. In order to be admitted to the Lord's Supper, you have to be baptised. So you can be a, a clear believer, clear evidences of a, being a believer, but you're not allowed the Lord's Supper unless you've been baptised. And yet this is a, a subject that even great men have disagreed over as to the method of baptism, because what they're talking about is a believer's baptism, being baptised, if you like, as an adult or of an age of understanding. That's what they're talking about. Unless you've had that, it doesn't count. But there are many men who their reading and understanding of scripture is that this is something that replaces the covenant. I don't want to get into all of this, but just to say that great men have not been those who have held great. You know what I mean by that. Just men of good understanding of scripture. Godly men have come to a different understanding about the method of baptism. It's a secondary issue. And yet some churches kind of make these things primary issues. Great danger of putting our authority or our prejudice on these things above the word of God. So, how do we answer? How do we answer this situation? How should the early church answer the question that faces them here? That staunch believers are saying they've got to be circumcised. These are not um, baddies who've crept in and trying to cause problems. Some of them might be. But generally these are converted. These are Christians who are um, Jews, who are Hebrew Christians. <coughs> very, perhaps they were, it says, they were Pharisees before. So they're very strong on these things. It takes time to understand, to come to comprehend what God requires. How do you answer? How do you come to understand these things? Of course, the answer is you, you go to the scriptures. You see what the Bible says. And then you apply that to your life. You know, in the Old Testament, in the NIV, 223 times it talks about the word of the Lord. Now, I haven't checked every one of those references, but I can tell you this, that the vast majority of them, when it says about the word of the Lord came, the word of the Lord spoke, what it's talking about is not someone was reading uh, Genesis or someone was reading Leviticus, the first five books of the Old Testament, the law, and so the word of the Lord said to them, those 223 times where it speaks about the word of the Lord in the Old Testament, it's talking about generally a prophet who's been raised up and God comes to them and says, now go and tell people 
what I tell you to tell them. And when he tells them, he's speaking the word of the Lord. And these things get written down. And they become the scripture to us. So that we too have the word of the Lord. So these prophets and others in the Old Testament, the word of the Lord came to them. God spoke to them and they spoke or they wrote. Or they acted on what God spoke to them. And it was written down. And the apostles, part of their role was to complete the task that was started in the Old Testament. They were to pen the New Testament. And so much of their lives was written down. Much of their words were written down. They wrote letters and so on, directed by the Holy Spirit. And they were proclaiming the word of the Lord. And so the two go together, don't they? And form what we have today, which is a complete canon of Scripture. And so for us, whilst we might talk about acting on thoughts that come into our mind, trying to understand uh, strange dreams or impressions on our hearts, some of these things may be from God. We may have to act on them. But how do we test it? How can we know? The Word of God. That's our rule, isn't it? That's our guide. The completed canon of Scripture. And the apostles here meeting at Jerusalem, they do the same thing. They set the example to us by looking at the Scriptures. Paul's account, remember, he's effectively, he's a, he's a prophet. Uh, sorry, Peter. Peter's account, and Paul too. But Peter's account, he's speaking as a prophet in a sense. God has spoken to him when he went to Cornelius' house. That was the word of the Lord. And that becomes scripture. And so Peter gives the account. And they weigh these things up as they did before. And they say, well, yes, that's scriptural. That's the new scripture that God has given us on these things. But then James gets up to speak, and I will turn you to uh, verse 17 of Acts chapter 15. He speaks about the words of the the prophets being in in agreement with what Peter has said. Again, the word of the Lord. And then he talks about David's fallen tent being rebuilt. And then he says, this is James speaking, he says, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear my name. And that is taken from, directly from the scriptures, from Amos. Amos in the Old Testament. So what does James do? James weighs up what Peter's been saying, listens to what Paul and Barnabas have been saying, and then he gives his verdict. But his verdict is based on trusting that what Peter is speaking is the word of God. And then looking into what they already had already of the word of God, the Old Testament, and seeing it's proclaimed there. And of course we can go back and we can think of Abraham, given the original promise that all nations or all peoples will be blessed through you. So it wasn't an exclusion zone ever to be just the gospel for the Jews only. And so the answer of the early church to this question, does a Gentile need to be circumcised and follow the law in order to be saved? The answer, no. Christ has abolished the mistaken belief that our fathers had that we must be and we must do in order to be saved. They're led by the Holy Spirit in their verdict. And they say in verse 28, which I didn't read, it seemed, this is a letter they sent to the Gentiles, verse 28 of Acts 15, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond, then he speaks about following requirements, things that would be offensive to Jews because of the pagan, pagan practice of them. Not things that were necessary in order to salvation, but just things to stop offending any Jews, particularly the Pharisees, and so on. And so we can say from this, turning back to Ephesians chapter 2, that Christ, Christ removes the hostility between Jew and Gentile. In verse 14 we read of Ephesians chapter 2, He himself is our peace. He's the peacemaker. 
Christ brings peace. He makes Jew and Gentile one. He removes the barrier. And so now the question is, how does he do that? How does he remove that barrier? Before we consider that, we have to think of, having thought of the Gentile problem, we have to think of the Jewish problem. And the Jewish problem was that they thought, having the law, having circumcision, I'm all right, mate. They thought that that made them perfect in God's sight, acceptable to God, just simply by the fact they they did things. They were circumcised and they followed these laws. But the Jewish problem was, as we've considered before, is that they too needed reconciling to God. Back to verse 3. All of us, Paul says, also lived among the world at one time, gratifying the cravings and desire, uh, the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we, now he's speaking as a Jew, like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Jew and Gentile alike both needed reconciling to God. The Jews, they had the temple, and they believed the presence of the Lord was in the temple. So therefore, Israel, as it says, uh, you've got this far away and nearby in verse 13 and in verse 17. Israel, well they were nearby, because they had the Jews, they had the temple. They had the Lord's presence in the temple, that made them nearby. Gentiles, they couldn't go in that temple. They were far away. Gentiles, sorry, the the Jews had the law and had circumcision, so they were nearby. But of course, the actual truth is that the Jews were nearby physically, but in their hearts, they were far, far away. I spoke earlier about my little wall that I built, and a friend didn't even push it, just put his hand on it, and it toppled over. That equates to man's best efforts to build a relationship with God, to try to get right by God by being or doing anything. Oh, there's my big wall, isn't it lovely? Down it goes. The best efforts of the Jews, circumcision, keeping the law, whatever other things they thought that they had or that they could do, they're no better than my wall. Jew and Gentile alike need saving, need reconciling. My wall represents man's attempts. So what does that lead us to? The conclusion that Jew and Gentile alike are all under sin, can do nothing about it, it leads us to Christ, the Reconciler. Verse 13. Now in Christ you, that's you Gentiles, who once were far away, have been brought near. How have they been brought near? Through the blood of Christ. It's the blood of Christ alone that brings the Gentiles who are far away, near. And actually, the Jews, who though they're near physically, are far away in their hearts. It's the blood of Christ that brings them near too. Look at verse 15, first part of verse 15. Christ abolishes in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. And what does he mean by that? What does Paul mean when he says that Christ abolishes in his flesh, by his blood if you like, abolishes in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations? First thing to say is that Christ kept the moral law. The moral law, we might think of the Ten Commandments that God gave. Christ kept that in its entirety, absolutely. Now, men and women may keep it um, 
in action. You may not go around murdering people. But Christ tells us that those laws don't just apply to your actions. They apply to your thoughts as well. And so when we think about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And loving your neighbour as yourself. As Christ tells us that these two sum up all the law. No one can say, I've done these things. Ah, but Christ did. And the law still stands. It's a law for us to live by, but not to be saved by. No one can be saved by trying to live by the law. But Christ, on our behalf, kept that moral law. But then secondly, what was it that set the Jews apart from the non-Jews. It was externals. The mark of circumcision. Ceremonial laws. Feasts. Foods. Sacrifices. The priesthood. All these things. But these were only temporary. All of these pointed to Christ. That's what they were all given for originally, were to point to Christ. Now the, the, the Jews abused them, they misunderstood them, they misused them. But they were given, they were meant to point to Christ. They saved no one. Christ came and he replaced these ceremonial laws and circumcision. He replaced these things with himself. And so we can say, Christ, the reconciler, he brings an end to hostility. I talked about the Berlin Wall falling down in 1989. Now again, who would have thought, as a child, I wouldn't have thought that that would ever happen. It seemed impossible that there was such a division, such a chasm between East and West. And yet it came down, didn't it? And it came down very rapidly when things really began to work. And that, we can say, is like the wall of separation between God and man. Jew and Gentile alike. And God separated by this chasm or by this wall, this barrier, this division. And yet, as Paul says here, he says... In verse 16, he came and put to death their hostility. Primarily, that's talking about the Jew and Gentile. But before that can happen, there has to be an end to this hostility between God and man. And the Berlin Wall, I was using as an illustration of that coming down, that hostility ending, that wall of separation between us and God, going away and going forever, going completely. End to the hostility through Christ the reconciler. How does he do this? Through the blood of Christ, it says in verse 13. Christ was, is the ultimate sacrifice. And in sacrificing himself, offering himself on the cross, he brings a twofold reconciliation. In him, Jew and Gentile are one. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one. His purpose, verse 15, was to create in himself one new man out of the two, Jew and Gentile, thus making peace. So Jew and Gentile are one in him. A new man. And then in this one body, verse 16, he reconciles both of them to God through the cross. There's your burning wall coming, tumbling down. Christ does it. Christ becomes our representative before God. A second type of human being. A second Adam. And he satisfies God's justice. Reconciles man to God. Therefore, as a consequence, brings peace between man and man. And this is uh, exactly what you read in Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, 
And if you look, you see in verse 20 there of Colossians. Verse 19, let's go from while you're finding it. Colossians 1 verse 19. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Whether things on earth or things in heaven. By making peace. How does he make that peace? Through his blood. Shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God. That's you, you Gentiles. And were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. But that includes you as well, doesn't it? But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. This great transaction between the Father and the Son. Christ the mediator, the go-between. He satisfies the justice of God by shedding his blood for the sin of the Jew and the Gentile. And reconciles them to God. But as a consequence, that brings peace between man and man. I don't know if anyone here has ever watched. Hopefully uh, you're working or you're uh, doing housework or shopping and you're not a, a person who sits there just watching television all day. But in the mornings... There is a program called, I don't know if it is called the Jeremy Kyle Show, but it's uh, a man called Jeremy Kyle who's on there. And I've never watched this. But the other week uh, I went to the gym and I was on the running machine and I was on there for quite a while actually. While I was on there they've got these screens in front of you. And there was no sound, you plug in your earphones for the sound. But on the program was uh, the Jeremy Kyle Show. I knew it because it kept flashing up Jeremy Kyle and what have you. And I knew the gist of these things already, but if you don't know what these programs are about, it's a kind of a counselling programme. It's a case of, um, you know, I've fallen out with my wife. And so, rather than sort of trying to be reconciled with her, maybe I've tried that. Maybe I've tried going to a friend or whatever. I'm going to air all my washing in front of the whole nation. We're going to come on to the Jeremy Kyle's show. We're going to have our dispute in front of everyone. That's effectively what they do. And while I watched this thing, there was a, I forget what the, the, the statement was, a statement came up and it said, what was the matter? This girl had fallen out with everyone else and she felt they were to blame and whatever. I don't know. Anyway, she was sat there looking quite mean and tough and ready for a fight and they brought on the different people that she'd fallen out with. And each one as they came on, you know, you could tell by the, the way their mouths were moving that they were doing this to her. And eventually things got so heated that one young man, he leapt from his chair. She had a man beside her eventually. He leapt from his chair and went to try and leap upon them both and attack them. And these huge security guards whose arms are thicker than my whole body came and sort of restrained him and what have you. And I got the impression that this is probably what always goes on on the Jeremy Kyle show. And it makes for good viewing. People listening to all the goss. And you wonder... How can that ever really reconcile anyone when they're doing this? Imagine that afterwards they meet up and have a punch-up or something. I don't know. But the point is, let's think of Jeremy Kyle. He acts as a go-between. He acts as a mediator. A reconciler. He tries to counsel them into coming to terms, coming to an agreement. But for him, when the programme is over, what does he do? He goes away, he goes home, he has his tea, and he forgets all about it. There's his nice fat paycheck in the bank, until the next time. He can forget about it. This mediator here, Christ, takes upon himself, in order to reconcile us to God, takes upon himself our sin. God made him who knew no sin, says 1 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who knew no sin... To be sin for us. He takes our sin. And he suffers. He suffers a cruel death. Upon the cross. What about our relationship? Man with man. The hostility that's there. Jeremy Kyle might just say, well, look, 
you're in the wrong here. You've got to forgive. You've got to forget. Come on, be reconciled. That's my counsel to you. What about if Jeremy Carl said, well, this is a big problem. You know, there's a real eruption on your estate where you live. I can see that there's going to be gang war there if something more isn't done. I tell you what I'm going to do, says Jeremy Carl. I'm going to come and live on your estate. And that way try to reconcile you. I'm going to set you both, both parties, an example of how you should live. And I'm going to help you at every step of the way so that you can live like that. Well, even that, which we would say is an incredible thing for Jeremy Kyle to do, even that falls short of what Christ has done for us. Because Christ, who is God the Son, He takes on flesh and He becomes one with us. And He makes from fallen man, the Jew and Gentile, the fallen man, He makes a new man doesn't just come and live on the estate by his spirit, he lives within us and he makes us new men, new women new children and he changes us from the inside he cleans the heart the new man I am a new creation now this leads me to want to say, to need to say two things the first one is this have you been reconciled to God that's the first one think of the being far away and coming near now outside today people are doing their Christmas shopping in the summer on a Sunday, we often uh, think of them because we, some of us have struggled to get here with the cars that are going to the boot fair. Many people are just waking up now. They've got sore heads. They've got their hangover. We would say, well, such people are far, far from God. All they're interested in, all Christmas is to them is a, a, an opportunity for a party. All they're interested in is serving themselves or serving their family. They're not interested in God. Physically, they're far away. But you know, there's a, an even more sinister danger. Because someone who's doing their Christmas shopping this morning and who doesn't give a hoot about God, it's obvious. They don't know anything about Him. They have no interest in Him. And yes, they will come to judgment. But their judgment will be based on what they know, which is not a lot greater, the more sinister danger is being physically near, hearing God's word looking the part having the attire as it were looking the part of the Christian but yet inwardly in your heart being far far away that what you hear has no impact on the heart. To be truly near means, yes, to be physically present, but also to hear and to believe and apply these things from the heart. To hear with the mind and to accept and believe in the heart. Now let me ask you, is that something you have done? Do you come to church because you like certain things? You're physically near. But are you spiritually near to God? Is the reason you come to church because you like certain things or certain people or whatever, gives you a certain amount of peace? Or is it because you've seen your need of being reconciled with God? And then even if you come and you've seen your need of being reconciled with God, are you coming and saying, well, I'm reconciled because look at all these things I've done. 
Look at me, I've been circumcised. Look at me, I follow the law. Is that you? Because that means you're far, far away. The only way one is near God is to be physically present, but to believe the message of free salvation by grace alone. Faith in Christ, repentance towards God, nothing in my hands I bring. Now, is that you? Have you been reconciled to him? And then the second thing to mention on this, the last thing to mention, though at some length, that third wall, the great wall of China, said it's as though it's always been there. My wall is gone. There's no trace of it remains. If you go up to Stoke now, you wouldn't even know there was ever a wall there. The Berlin Wall is just a memory. I think you can see bricks of it in certain places. There may have even left of it. I haven't been there for you to see and look over. But effectively, what it stood for is gone. And you can go through from east to west. But the Great Wall of China, it still stands. And that, I suggest to you, represents the division between man and man. Because you see, that falls last. We must be reconciled to God before that division between man and man can fall. Reconci reconciliation will only work truly after reconciliation to God. And the early church shows us that this isn't always easy. That this reconciliation, it takes time. For the early church, they, they show us, don't they, that one has to have a correct understanding of things. And then that understanding has to work on the heart. Well, of course, if you're a believer, and there's been hostility between man and man in your heart. Becoming a believer, you have this new heart. And from the inside out, you're being changed. But it's all new stuff, like the early church. And you've got to comprehend with these things and wrestle with these things. What should I do about this? What should I do about that? I remember when I was first a believer, I wasn't sure uh, whether one could drink alcohol, whether one could do this or one could do that. And you go through all sorts of, do you have to wear certain clothes or all these sorts of things? Because there were some people who were saying such. But you have to go to the Word of God, don't you? Go to the Word of God. And let God speak to you through His Word. And then act upon it. To get the correct understanding. And let that work on our hearts. Sometimes that takes time. Sometimes that's instantaneous. Do you remember me last week telling you about two brothers? And they had a shop. And they got on famously. Until one day, they were busy, and one brother took a dollar, and he placed it on the till, but he didn't bring it in because there was other customers waiting. He thought, I'll do that in a moment. About five minutes later, when it was clear, he went to do it, but it wasn't there. And he said to his brother, did you bring in that dollar that was on the till? What dollar, said his brother. Didn't you see it? No, I didn't. Are you sure you didn't see it? And there was this note of accusation, a hint of mistrust. And suddenly, wallop, the division began. And it grew so strong. If you remember, I told you that they still had the one building. They still lived in the one building. But they put a, put a petition right down the middle of it. His and his. And they didn't speak for years and years because of it. And after many years, this man came into the shop. And he said, uh, excuse me, can I ask you to this frail-looking old man? Can I ask you, have you been here long? Ever since I can remember, says the man. He said, well, that's good, he said, because you're the person I need to speak to. He said, doesn't, the layout doesn't look quite right, but he said, it was like this. He said, years ago, when I was a very young man, 
I fell on hard times, he said, and I was scratching around for food. He said, and I happened to be going down the lane at the back of his shop. The door was open, it was a summer's day. And just as I went past, I saw a dollar bill on the till. I looked and people were all busy at the front of the shop. I shouldn't have done it, he said, but I couldn't resist it. I came in and I stole the dollar bill. He said, I've I've sorted my life out now. I'm a a better man, let's say. But that has played on my conscience ever since. And I feel I I need to come and just to put things right. I know it's many years have gone by, but here's your dollar bill. If you need more, let me give you more. He couldn't get any further because the old man in front of him was shaking uncontrollably in tears. What's the matter, said the man? Come with me, was all he could get out took him next door, the other side of the petition, and said, tell my brother exactly what you've just told me. And there was reconciliation between these two. Sometimes it's instant. Correct understanding, misunderstanding, working on the heart. By the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, Christ creates a new humanity. He puts to death the hostility, man to man. He removes the pride in our hearts. She's wronged me, I'll pay her out. He's wronged me, I'll get him. He removes that pride and he replaces it with a humility. So that we look and we see the foulest of men and we say, but for the grace of God, there go I. A person says, yes, but what she's done to me is intolerable. It's all very well saying, I should be reconciled to her, but I could never be reconciled to her. Well, I could never be reconciled to him. I could never put things right with that person because they've done such and such. But then we must stop. And we must think, whatever grievances we have with one another, they're like a drop in the ocean compared to the grievance God has with us. And he's righteous. And yet God is willing to forgive us. Should we not be willing to forgive one another from our hearts, Jew and Gentile? Man and man. It's one of the consequences of our own forgiveness. Think of the Lord's Prayer. What do we say in the Lord's Prayer? Or in the NIV, it's forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. We can't expect God to forgive us if we won't forgive those whom we've wronged. Maybe they've wronged us as well. It takes two to tango, doesn't it? There's two sides to every story. Usually it's misunderstanding. Turn to Matthew, chapter 18, please. And here you have a classic example of a person being forgiven so much and yet not being willing to forgive so little. Here's a man in Acts, in Acts, in Matthew 18. Here's a man, and the whole passage starts from verse uh, 23, but I'm not going to read it from there because it takes too long perhaps, but here's a man who owes someone 10,000 talents. It's a king. And he owes him effectively millions of pounds. And the king says, pay your money. And he says, I can't. And the king says, right, you're going to be thrown in prison. I'm going to get rid of all your family. Sell them. Sell them. To pay the debt. Let me read this, verse 26. The servant fell on his knees, begged him, be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay you back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. Wonderful. And that represents our debt to God. Millions of pounds. Can't possibly pay it. But then look at what happens next. Verse 28, the servant goes out, finds one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, which is just a few pounds. 
And he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. The fellow servant fell to his knees, begged him, be patient with me, I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead he went off, had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. The master called the servant in. You wicked servant, I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, righteous anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Jesus says, verse 35, This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. And then, doesn't Jesus also say, as you look for Romans, uh, Romans chapter 12, doesn't Jesus also say, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of of God. And in this passage in Ephesians that we've been looking at four times, it speaks about Christ making peace, bringing peace. And then in Romans chapter 12, and from verse 17, we have these words. Well, it's, yeah, from verse 17. Do not, be, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay. So you've clearly been wronged. Let God do the one, be the one who repays, not you. Do what you can to be reconciled. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I will repay. It is mine to avenge. On the contrary, says the Lord, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to eat. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, there's so much that is, is packed into this. It's hard to bring all this out in all its fullness. There's, Two things are reconciliation with God, but what I wanted to get onto was this reconciliation man to man. Both, both are vital. Could have split it up into two messages. But I want to try and bring it in one. And let me close with these thoughts, or this challenge, this question. Are you still in hostility? Is there still enmity in your heart toward your fellow man. Whoever it is, whatever the situation, don't, however, try to be reconciled man to man before you've been reconciled to God. That's like the person who says, I need to get right with God. I'll give up drinking, I'll give up smoking, I'll stop gambling, I'll uh, pay off all my debts, I'll do all this, then I'll come to God when I've got a clean suit on. It doesn't work that way. You come to God as you are. Repentance and faith. But there's so much needs sorting out in my life. You can't do it on your own. God alone does it. You come to Him, He gives you this new heart, this new life. I am a new creation. And that changes us from within. And comes then the strength for humility, if it's necessary, to be reconciled, to put right what is wrong, and to sort out all the other things. And he then shows you whether it's right to give up drinking or this, that, and whatever it might be. But here especially, to be reconciled. Don't try to be reconciled to man before you've sought reconciliation from God. That is the greater barrier. Then in verse 18, through him, through Christ, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. So there's a man, there's a woman, and you say, I've been reconciled to God, but I have this against my brother, this against my sister, this against my fellow man. I find it such a war 
can't scale over it. I want to be right with them as far as possible as it depends on me. I want to put things right. But I'm scared. But I don't know how to do it. But I still feel this pride at work in me. Through him we have access to the Father by one Spirit. Pray! Pray! Seek God's help. And then seek to end that particular conflict. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. That kind of carnal warfare, the East Enders stuff. Ever inadvertently put East Enders on while you're trying to get a channel? We ever hear is shouting. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. That kind of carnal warfare is ended. It's over. The great wall of China, such as it is, has come toppling down. Therefore, put down your armour and be a peacemaker. And Christ will shine on you. Amen.